And, and obviously, we knew Caleb Williams a year ago. He came in this year with a lot of hype, uh, already was anointed as being that number one overall pick. And did he always live up to it this past year? No, it wasn't all perfect. But I think that he showed the talent that teams are really excited about. And we have to remember the scouting slogan for every team is traits over production. You know, it's good. Obviously, you want these guys to win. You want them to have uh, these big time stats. But above all, teams are going to draft traits. That's what translates to the next level. And with Caleb, you know, aside from having the physical tools, he has a good arm. He's a mobile athlete. There are really two areas that stand out the most with him. First is his football awareness. I, I think you throw on the tape. doesn't matter which tape you throw on. He shows that he has that unique feel for everything going on around him. You know, he knows how the defense is trying to attack him. He knows where his weapons are at all times. And there are times where he'll pass on a single or a double looking for that home run. But more times than not, he's cr in that creation mode out of necessity. So there is a method to the madness that what he's doing. And so he has that rare football awareness to turn a broken play into a positive. Uh, so that would be number one. And then number two, something that really separates him uh, from, from watching him is it doesn't matter the awkward position that he is in. He has that rare body balance and torque in his hips and, and velocity uh, with his arm, accuracy with his arm, where he can create these throws. You know, Matthew Stafford has that because you know, he has one of the strongest arms in the league. Mahomes can do that because he has that, that uh, body balance. Caleb's somewhere in the middle because he has the base, the balance, a really strong arm. He has touch. So he can make some of these difficult uh, difficult throws appear easy. So even though with, uh, with Caleb, there is a little bit of uh, frenzy to the way he plays, I do think there's more method to the madness than he gets credit for. Okay, the, the off-schedule plays are really exciting. They're fun to watch. What does he look like inside a structure? Mm -hmm. and, and that's one of the questions. Um, I, I do think that he uh, is better negotiating the pocket uh, than most quarterbacks that that you know we've seen come out of college the last few years. It's not just I think we think of Caleb as this run around guy outside the pocket. He works the pocket really, really well. Um, I think the biggest thing with him, it, it, all, there are plenty of times where you can see him go one to two to three with his reads, with his progressions. And the biggest thing for him, and we see this with a lot of young quarterbacks, is the mental clock, understanding how, how quickly to eliminate those reads and get to number two, get to number three, or when, when are the times when I need to linger on this one read because it's about to come open. So that would be kind of one of the main areas, working from inside structure, inside the pocket, and going through those reads. A lot of times he couldn't because the protection didn't hold up. You know, He had to create out of necessity. Um, and the only other, the other big question I have with Caleb is really just the fumbles. I really like the way he took care of the ball in terms of not throwing interceptions. He had 199 pass attempts on third or fourth down at USC. Didn't throw a single interception on those 199 pass attempts. But the fumbles are a different story. Uh, 33 over the last three years. He led the all of college football in touchdowns the last three years, 120. Also led all of college football in fumbles with those 33. Needs to get better at the ball security. Uh, that needs to be a point of emphasis for him. But uh, again, I think the uh, there's far more positives than negatives when we talk about Caleb and his game translating to the next level. If you can remember, has any quarterback at the number one spot come into a position that's as comfortable is what Caleb would come into where it's a team that's not a, like he doesn't have to do what Bryce Young is trying to do down there in Charlotte. He comes into a team that is poised, I think, to to be a playoff contender. What other players can you think of that were able to walk into something like that as a as a first round pick? Not many, um, I, especially when we talk about those top three picks. Usually those teams are picking up there for a reason. And it's, you know, I, I go back to when I really first started getting involved with the draft, uh, being an Ohio guy. Cleveland Browns come back to the league in 1999. I think Tim Couch would have been a really good quarterback had he gone anywhere else. But he went to an expansion franchise that had tissue paper for an offensive line, and he couldn't do anything. He was beat up. His confidence was destroyed. Uh, you could probably say the same thing about David Carr going to an expansion franchise in Houston. So this, more times than not, teams picking up at the top of the draft, it's, it's a tough hole to dig yourself out of. 
And with Caleb, it, it certainly is the opposite. Obviously, you know, there's a trade involved. So the Bears, they were not uh, the number one in terms of earning the number one overall pick because they had the worst record. Um, with the moves they've made this offseason, it seemed like a roster that's on the rise, uh, especially on offense. The offensive line uh, has gotten better year over year the last three seasons. You look at adding a Keenan Allen to the wide receiver mix and and what that will do for the quarterback. Uh, and they're, they're probably not done adding receivers. I, you know, they have only four draft picks, but it wouldn't be surprised if they use one of those draft picks towards uh, one of these quarterbacks, maybe at number nine overall. So you, you're absolutely right. This is a unique situation. And if you're Caleb, uh, you have to feel very – and I know when Justin Fields was traded, there was some backlash like, oh, Caleb, will, uh, he shouldn't want to go to Chicago. No, he's going to a good situation on a team that is on the upswing and plenty of reasons to be optimistic. Our draft coverage on the score is presented by Chevy Drives Chicago.com and the number one draft pick, Chevy Silverado, the official truck partner of the Chicago Bears. Dan, I do want to ask you about that ninth pick overall, especially given that the Bears do have some options for need here. And there are some rich classes in this draft. What are your thoughts about the Bears having that number nine and what do you think might happen? Yeah, I think it's interesting because uh, this has been a team that has wanted the draft picks. You know, if you're Ryan Poles, give me all the draft picks. Let's build this roster the way I want to build it. But now they're in a unique position where, sure, they could still do that. They could still trade back and maybe set themselves up for next year's draft or add more draft capital this year and continue to build that roster. I don't think that'd be a bad way to go, but they also have a chance to get a top 10 player in this draft in a draft that is a not every draft is a good year to be picking top 10 this year is one of those years where it's a great year to be picking in the top 10 because of the blue chip talent that's available at the top and if one of those three receivers talking about marvin harrison jr malik neighbors roma dunze if one of those receivers are there at nine he wouldn't be there at 10 because I'm taking him at nine. I think that's what the Bears should do. And I think there's a good chance that the, what they will do. Uh, because you're thinking about Caleb Williams. If you're drafting him at number one, you're thinking about him as your quarterback for the next 10 years. So yeah, getting Keenan Allen for this year uh, is awesome. And that's exciting. But as you project what your 2025 roster looks like, 2026, uh, adding a Roma Dunze, say, say he's available there at nine, I don't think you're regretting that move. This is in a uh, modern day NFL where wide receivers, that's what moves the needle. That's what scores points, changes the, the scoreboard and influences the win loss record. Uh, maybe the second most beside behind only quarterback. It's debatable. Uh, so if you have a chance to get a really good one, a bon bona fide number one receiver, even if it's not the number one need on your roster for 2024, I'm coming away from this draft with the top player available I'm not necessarily focusing on need. I'm just going with the best player available. And I think that could end up being one of these receivers. Uh, and if you're Chicago, I just know it'd be very tough to trade away from, say, a Roma Dunze if he's there at nine. We're talking with Dane Brugler on the Bernstein and Holmes show, broadcasting live from Stadium Swim at Circa Resort and Casino, home of the world's largest sports book here in Las Vegas. Dane, you obviously go into this process with some not yet fully formed idea of who ranks where, and then eventually you put a number next to a name and you, you finalize it. Among skill position players, who ended up higher ranked than you thought going in? And who was a notable name that you, when all was said and done, ended up lower ranked than you expected? Yeah, and, and it's tough doing that because I'm doing this from a general point of view, right? I don't have a specific scheme I'm scouting for or a specific culture. And so I have to do it from a very generalized view. And, you know, that that's always tough to do. It, it, it's it's something that in the, in the report you try to be specific about where he's best. You know, maybe he's just a slot only receiver or maybe he's best for this and that. And so you try to be as specific as possible. Um, but I, I think, you know, to answer your question, Malik Washington from Virginia, third round, fourth round wide receiver. Uh, he is a lot better than I thought over the summer. And then what I even thought maybe around Thanksgiving, um, a, a former Northwestern receiver who obviously 
didn't get a chance to uh, with the offense the way it's been there at Northwestern in the last few years. Didn't really get a chance to show what he could do. He transfers to Virginia, and you know, he's not a big guy. He's five eight and a half, one hundred ninety pounds. But uh, and look, Steve. There's no Steve Smith. There's only one Steve Smith, uh, one Hall of Famer. But we compare someone to Steve Smith every year, and if we have to do that. I'm going to do it with Malik Washington because he has that ability to go up and make plays, make adjustments on the football. He can get open. So Malik Washington is one of those surprise names that, uh, you know, the more you watch, watching him live at the Shrine Bowl, watching more tape on him, you're just like, this guy is really good. And I, I, if this is a deep receiver class, so he might not be drafted until the 14th, 15th, 16th receiver off the board. But I won't be surprised at all if he makes an immediate impact for the team that drafts him. Um, a, a player that may be a little bit lower than I thought coming in, uh, Troy Franklin from Oregon, who I still I still like. He's a good player. I just I thought maybe there's a chance he'd be a, a first round type of guy. But after doing more work on him, I saw him more as a late two, early three. Um, you know, 180 pounds. He's very lean, very lanky. Fights the ball at times, more of a linear receiver. So he's going to have some big plays. There's no doubt about it. But as a consistent snap in, snap out receiver, um, not just to- I'm not totally sold on Troy Franklin as being that reliable guy. I think if if you're saying over under pick 50 for Troy Franklin, I think that's a pretty good line about where exactly he's he's going to go. Not late first, but more borderline top 50 pick. How far ahead is Brock Bowers of the other tight ends? Um, uh, Grand Canyon. I don't, it, it's a lot. Uh, I mean, we're, we're we're talking about a guy that's different. Uh, the versatility that he offers, uh, the ways that he can win, uh, both with speed and athleticism, or toughness and physicality, or ball skills. I mean, he he really has it all, and he's a good blocker. Um, not someone you want in line uh, 100% of the snaps, but that's not why you're drafting him. You know, you want him to be a central part of your offense as a target and in receiving threat. Um, one of the things I love about his game is he is a master of the hidden yards. So for most tight ends, they're getting uh, seven yards on a play. He finds a way to get 11. Like He just has this toughness to him that is, uh, it, it, he can make a guy miss, but he can also break tackles. And then he'll drag tacklers as well. So people point out he's not very big, 6'3", 245. He is a lot tougher than just what he looks like. So he was the offense at Georgia. Uh, it all went through him. And I think wherever he goes, just you need a plan for him. You, you, the offensive coordinator has to understand this is how we're best going to utilize him as a slot slash Y slash hybrid joker tight end. He's a little bit of everything. You want him taking jet sweeps? Great. You want him in the slot? Great. You want him outside? He can do that. You want him on the wing? He can do that as well. So you just have a, have a plan for Brock Bowers. And I think somewhere in the top 12 picks, seems a little bit early for a tight end. Someone's going to recognize the value that it's going to bring to their offense, and they're going to pull the trigger that early. He, he's worth it. Last year at this time, we were using Bijan Robinson as a data point regarding running back valuation. And I'm curious what NFL people, what, what you're getting, the vibe that you're getting from around the league about the fungibility of the position, about how much teams are willing to spend. How are running backs valued right now? They're an essential part of offensive football in, in today's NFL. It's just the valuation is a sliding scale. It, it's something that each team feels a little bit differently about how the best way to address the position. Uh, there are a lot of running backs in this in this draft, but at the same time, we saw a lot of teams spend on running backs in free agency. We, we saw, I felt like once free agency started, the first 10 updates – Eight were running backs, you know, being signed places. And so you can find the running back position, third round, fourth round, fifth round. I think a lot of teams are going to go that route in terms of building their their running back depth chart. We're just we're missing that Bijan this year. We don't have there's a good chance we don't see a running back in the top 50 this year, which would only be the second time ever that's ever happened in an NFL draft where we didn't have a running back go in the top 50 picks. But once we get to the third round. A lot of these guys are going to fly off the board, talking about Jonathan Brooks uh, from Texas, Blake Corum, Michigan, uh, Trey Benson, Florida State, Braylon Allen, Wisconsin. A lot of these guys have something to offer, but each team looks at it a little bit differently about the resources they want to put into that position. 
Dan, is there anybody who is contradicting maybe the popular data that's out there that has either impressed you or maybe somebody that has red flags that you think what people are saying is not what I have observed? Um, you know, I think that's because uh, obviously you can't do this in a vacuum, right? You know, you can't totally isolate yourself from all the million other opinions on these players and uh, whether it's in a good way or a bad way, you know, some people are higher on, on, pro, on players than, than others. Um, you know, for, for example, I'm lower on say uh, a Xavier Leggett uh, from some South Carolina. I see a good player. I like him, but if I have to draft him in the top 40, that, that's a little too early for me. Um, you know, there are other players that uh, maybe I don't like quite as much, or maybe I'm, I'm a little bit higher on uh, say like a guy like a Marius Mims from Georgia, only eight starts to his name. That's that's tough. Uh, drafting a player in the top 25 with only eight career starts. Uh, but Amarius Mims is built differently. I mean, they broke the mold with this guy. He is huge. He's athletic. He's strong. Missed some time due to injuries. But there, there's a difference between inexperienced and raw. And he is more inexperienced than he is raw. His first start looked like he belonged right away. And so Amarius Mims is a top 20 player for me. But for, I know, some others... He's more of a late first rounder or even further down than that because, again, only eight starts, doesn't have the body of work. And I can understand why that'd be a roadblock for some people. Uh, but I'm going to bet on the traits. Uh, again, traits over production. That's what I'm going to bet on. And this guy, Amarius Mims from Georgia, has some rare traits that you just don't see walk through the door every day. Very cool. Dane, we appreciate it.